everyone uh welcome it is wednesday today not thursday um as you well those of you that are online know um, we switched it a day earlier nothing to do with the big food eating festival tomorrow in the us um it's just some other stuff we need to fit in however uh we are live just as we normally are for the next hour and we're going to spend that hour editing that stuff um so capture one Capture One being the software program that we use to edit our images. So when you take a picture in raw format on your camera, we then load it into a processor. Capture One is one of those, and we uh, hopefully improve the image. Sometimes we make some mistakes and we make the image worse, but we're going to try and uh, cover any of those today. So you're all welcome to join in. Um, please do make this as interactive as you want. In other words, if I do something on the screen that doesn't make sense or you have a question, Put it in the comments box on the live chat um, for those of you that are online, and we'll try and cover as many of them as we can during this next hour. So before we get started, let's talk about Capture One. So this is version 21 that you're seeing at the moment. It's not exactly a secret that version 22 is around the corner. Interestingly enough, for those of you uh, that want to have a play with 22, remember you can sign up to Capture One's beta program. So they have a program you can um, log on to your CaptureOne.com account, uh, go into the Your Account section, you'll find a section in there um, that allows you to apply to join the beta program. Um, once you've done that and been approved, you'll be able to download advanced versions of their software, and that will probably include version 22 in there, um, which is the next version that's coming along. Now, one thing to say on that, because um, I've had a couple of people ask me questions, as always is the case around this time of year, um, be really careful with using beta software in your production environment or in your live environment. Please take a copy of any catalogs you have or any sessions you're, you're using. Just, just please go careful. The reason it's beta software is because it's designed to find bugs. It's not ready yet. That's why it's a beta version or a beta version if you want to... Um, depending on how you want to say it um, but that's why it's that version and not a production version because they know there are going to be bugs in it there's going to be things that aren't running as expected and the reason that they get other people to have a play with it is because more people more eyes more chances of finding bugs but that's the point it's there to find bugs so please apply download enjoy that um, the pre-release software at will but be very aware it is exactly that pre-release so for this session, and for all of your production stuff, you should be using the latest version of Capture One, which is 14.4.1. You'll see that little box up there. If you go to the About um, screen in Capture One, you'll get to that box, and that box will tell you the version that you're on. If you're on version 20, it will say 13 point something, and then there's a big gap, and version 12 was before that, 11, 10, 9, and so on. If you're on version 20, or 13 point something, most of what we covered today you're going to be able to follow along. If you're on version 12 or before, there are going to be some gaps in what we can do, so you might want to consider looking at um, upgrading to the latest version. I know there's there's some little sale thing that goes on around this time every year, um, so there may be some offer stuff on, but life's about choices. You, you choose what you want to do. Um, for this session, we're going to be running on the latest version of 21, and... Let's get into, in fact, before we get into Catch One, I'm going to mention one more thing, um, which we sort of covered last week, but I disappeared off the screen when we did. In a couple of weeks' time, um, David and I will be trying again that live stream session um, on location. We know it works on location, it's just the weather didn't work last time. So keep an eye out on Capture One's channel. You'll see it um, put up there very soon. There'll be a placeholder to the live um, stream. We're going to be rooftop shooting um, with, hopefully, some new things to show you. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But we will be um, trying it again. For those of you that missed the last time we did it, it didn't work so well. So let's, uh, let's hope this one works a little bit better. But for now, for today, let's get into Capture One, and we're going to start with the image that I left off last time, or, or finished off with last time, because Alan actually sent in an email afterwards um, saying there was another question. Um, so the initial question was, you know, am I done in editing? Um, you know, how does it look? And, and my challenge to Alan, I guess, was the crop needed a bit more space on this left-hand side. So to edit the crop in Capture One, um, click on the crop tool up here. You've got the ability to fix the aspect ratios. If you click and hold, you can change your aspect ratios here. You can also add your own ones by clicking up there. 
or you can right click when you're in the crop tool and you can get access to the same little menu and it'll give you a, a pixel size and whatever as a reference. In this case, this is how we left it with the crop, but the question that Alan then followed up with was what about this color in the top right hand side? So we're gonna leave the crop where it is and just look at this bit um, in future. Um, so let's ignore everything we did last week. Um, if you wanna watch that, then, then go back to last week. But for all of this stuff now, um, we're gonna focus on this top right hand side. And Capture One has a couple of ways that we can attack color. So what this is by the look of it, obviously there was a bit of sunlight. Um, so this looks like it was in the shade for most of the image. Maybe there was a, I don't know, like a tree line or something, because this looks like shadow. And then we've got the sunrise or sun hitting some of the water up here. Obviously when the sun hits the water, it changes the apparent color of the water. So it goes from this deep blue to a sort of a greeny yellow. And we want to even, or either even that out or at least somehow sort of blend that in so it doesn't look quite so different to the rest of the sea. So we've obviously got within Capture One, I'm going to right click and go to Clone Variant. The reason for that is I've got this original one here to reference now. So even though I've got before and after, which shows me the raw file through to the edited version, if I now make changes to this variant, I don't have a baseline to go back to. And I'd encourage everyone, whenever you're doing an edit on an image, almost um, do it as snapshots. So when you're finished with one look and you think, actually, that's done, maybe that's the base edit, so I'm happy with that. Rather than just continuing on, of course you can undo, but sometimes it's nice to have a, 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 an ability, I guess, to reference back to what you had before. So create a variant, clone the variant. The variants don't take up much space because all they are is the list of adjustments. You haven't duplicated the actual raw file. There's only one raw file. What you've got is a new container for the raw file with all of the existing adjustments we've made in the original one. But now, as I start making more adjustments, I can compare it back to the previous. Quite often in my edits, I will have five or six different variants for the same shot. They're not necessarily completely different treatments, but they're ones where I'll snapshot because I'm happy with that, and now I might want to try something else, so I'd do it on a new variant, so I'd, I can always go back to the state that I was happy with. So with that one created there, let's look at the tools that we've got. So number one, we don't want to affect the whole picture. So I could say, well, we can play with the white balance. So let's go to our background layer and just pick on white balance and cool everything down. Well, that's got this bit in the top right now a lot bluer, but wow, that's hurting my eyes on the left. Um, so let's just undo that one and we're going to think about it slightly differently. Um, just to um, Joris's point, it would be great if we could label variants so we know what the variant is for. I agree um, and the reason I agree with that is I get a little bit, um, I guess, fed up with color tags. You've got, I think it's seven different color tags. Ratings, you've obviously got one to five um, that you can choose um, against the variant. So I can make this variant, you know, a, uh, where are we? A, a green color tag, a red color tag, a yellow color tag, and so on with my keys. That's just the plus minus times divide keys. Um, I can also rate it one, two, three, four, five, and so on. But it would be kind of good to be able to have something in there that, that flagged it. This one's a, I don't know, draft. This one's pre, uh, pre-sharpening or whatever. Of course, in Capture One, if you go to the metadata tag, you can put in keywords and you can put in a description in here, which is then searchable. So if I put a keyword in saying um, Alan 2, then if I now search in my list up here for Alan 2, it's going to show me that file on its own. It's a bit clunky, but you can have a keyword, let's say for pre-sharpened or exported or finished. Um, so you can do it. It's just with keywords rather than necessarily um, through tags and stuff like that. But yeah, I personally, I'd like a few more options in there, but what you need to work out is your own system. So for me, I have one star as selects, two stars as out of those selects, these are the ones that I might edit. Three stars are the ones that are definitely gonna be edited. Four is completely edited, and five is exported and finished. Um, but that's up to you. That's, that's, that's your system to work out. Um, so let's have a little look um, back at this corner. So we know that changing white balance does change the color of that C, but it changes everything. So, of course, we're not going to do it based on that. We're going to do it with a new layer and with maybe a very soft gradient, 
So as I draw my gradient in, which is this tool here, I can rotate that gradient. There we go there. And if I think about this carefully, <clears throat> I don't want to affect really the white foam or any of the other bits over here. So it may be that a Luma range might help us here. So a Luma range normally is only, well, not normally, it is only referencing values of brightness effectively, hence Luma. But what I could do in here is try and find the bits of that water. So look, there's the green bits that are happening around here. And if I ever want to find out the luminance of an area I'm trying to attack, if I just move my mouse over here, it'll tell me at the top, 117. So this is 127, that's 127, that's 152, 134, 110, 120. So as I move my mouse around, this last number here is giving me the Luma value, not just the red, green, and blue value. So the, the combined effective um, brightness value. So with that done, if I go to Luma range, I know that it sits somewhere in the range of roughly 110, up to maybe 140 or so. If I tick display mask, we can see now that I'm attacking pretty much only the bits of the water that are green because these blue values luckily enough are either a lot brighter or a lot darker than what I really wanted. Now I can soften the edges of this so I can add some radius on there so it looks a little bit more natural as it blends to the bits that aren't masked and if I really want to soften that blend well I can add a ramping or a, a fall off. So what this says is it's not as binary as at 109, we include it in the mask, and at 109, we don't. So 108 is not included, 109 is. You know, a very hard fall off. What I can tell Capture One, though, is at 95, start including it in the mask, slowly add and add and add more until you get to 100% at 109. And that gives us a smooth ability to, to control it. So now I've got that masked, let's just call this one top right. Oops. Color. With that mask, let's just cool down the white balance. And now we have a much more blue, in general, color to that corner. If we think that it's also needing a little bit of exposure adjustment, well, I can drop down that exposure, but be careful with that. What we might want to do is play with contrast a bit, just to bring it back up to be... Um, as, we, as we start to flatten down those mid-tones, you might lose some contrast and detail. So boosting up the contrast might help you a little bit here. If this has got a bit of a greeny tint to it, of course we can go into our color editor. So, and I'll talk about the other ways in a bit, but we can do it in color editor. We can take out the green or we can shift the green's hue to be more green or more blue. Really though, these are probably more cyan. So if I shift that there, I can lower the lightness as well. I could use the skin tone tool. So I could flatten out the entire range of all the blues and greens. But in here, I kind of don't need to. Most of it can be done with just this white balance shift and maybe a little tint change. So as I move the tint to the right, it's going to go more pink. To the left, it's going to go more green. Let's just undo that. And in this case, I'm just going to make it a touch more pink. So just to remove some of the green as a tint out of it. Now we know that these numbers, because we did them in the Luma range, they're in the mid-tones. And as I move my mouse over, you can see the orange bar on the, the histogram on the left-hand side moving around. It's all in the mid-tones. So my high dynamic range doesn't help me here. What does help me is clarity. So clarity will allow us to increase contrast in those mid-tones. And this is what we're using to counter the Luma range. If you imagine that Luma range, the risk is that as a result of, of applying that Luma range on the mid-tones and shifting it, we can flatten down some of the tones and colors. So clarity is going to add in a little pop of contrast again, um, back to where we wanted it. Now, there's still some yellowy stuff in here, so I'm going to go to my color editor, go to the yellow tab, and we're going to desaturate it and maybe darken it a touch. Maybe shift it, uh, no, maybe a bit to the red, actually. That sort of helps us a bit. And while I'm looking at this, I'm just tweaking tiny amounts of white balance and maybe even the mask a little bit to include a bit more of this side. And all of these things are really, really small, almost micro adjustments. But here's the reason why we keep the previous variant, because now I can go back and compare. And if I look at that corner now, just zoom in. So if you ever want to zoom in on more than one image at a time, select more than one image. 
and hold down the shift key as you zoom and it will zoom into the same position on both images at the same time. So in this case here, we've got our previous one on the left with that sort of murky, greeny, yellowy smudge and the one on the right, which is better. It's not perfect, but it is better. So the final step that we could look at as a way of making this completely uniform is, again, let's create a new clone of that variant so we can go back to it, with either the same layer, bearing in mind it's got a luma range, or luma range on it, so it's not going to affect everything in that corner, or with a new layer, which is what I'm going to do. Um, there's a reason I've called it STT, you'll see in a second why. And I'm going to draw a really, really, really wide band um, graduated filter across it. In my color editor, I've got one other tool, which is called Skin Tone. So the advanced color editor allows us to select a color and we can shift its hue and, and so on. The Skin Tone tool, even though it's called Skin Tone, is for any time you want to even up a range of colors to be more uniform. So let's have a little look. If I now apply that Skin Tone tool and choose the color in here that I want to change, that's the key thing. I'm choosing the color that I want to make an adjustment to, which is this sort of greeny color, maybe even here. Let's just pick another area. So maybe we go, uh, let's go there. Yeah, a bit more green, okay. So the first thing we're gonna do with the Skin Tone tool, in fact, there's, there's a little thing. I can take this tick out here, which will isolate, it's difficult on this shot, I know, but it isolates all the other colors apart from the range that you have selected. Now, with that selected color range in this shot, because everything else is quite monotone, you don't really see the difference. But you can get confused here because you'll see that even this is selected in the Skin Tone tool. So that color range is going to be selected. But remember, we have a mask applied on this layer. So even though I'm affecting all of that color on this layer, it's only going to apply into that top corner, which is where I have masked. So in this case, I want to shift that hue of this greeny color, and I can do that. I can go slightly more pink, slightly more or yellowy green. So if you if you imagine on the color wheel, you've got from here, as I move it to the right, and it's a bit confusing because it goes the opposite way to the wheel, move it to the right, it's going to shift it along here, so more blue, more pink. As I move it to the left, it's going to shift it along here to be more green. And in this case, we want to shift it to be a bit more bluey pink. We might want to decrease saturation. It's going to make it look gray and, and washed out. Or we can increase it a little bit. Tiny amounts in this case. And then the lightness. I want to darken it down just a touch there. Now, that's changed the value of the color that I selected in the Skin Tone tool. But what about all the surrounding colors? So in other words, not this dot anymore, but all of this area that's included in that range. And I'm going to tell Capture One now to make everything from this area here down to this area here more uniform in relation to the colors that I've selected here. So I've taken a color. I then tell Capture One what I want to do with that color. And then I tell Capture One of everything that's around that color in my selection here. And I can change it so I can make it into the more greeny areas or less of the bluey areas. But with that color range, how close, effectively, I want to move all of the colors that are in this entire wedge and its outside parts towards that color that we've now um, prescribed. And I can say I want it to be, let's do it, completely uniform in hue, saturation, and lightness. But what you'll see is everything's got flat. And the reason is because obviously all the contrast has gone. We've changed the lightness values. So everything has gone flat. It's headed towards the same place. So we'll leave lightness where it is. Saturation, though, I might want to actually really boost up. And keeping the hue uniform is helping us a lot. So with that layer, if I turn that off and turn it on, you'll see it's a really subtle change. But it's that final little bit of trying to even up the color across the whole frame. So there with the skin tone tool loaded on, there with the white balance um, and a luma range on the top right hand side, and there was our original. If we go from original to new, we can see there's quite a big change to that top right hand corner. And I'm hoping, Alan, <laughs> that's that's what you wanted. Um, but yeah, if, if it wasn't, <laughs> email, email in again. We'll, we'll load up this one again next time as well. Um, 
So, where are we? Couple of... There are a couple of questions. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I've missed a few. Right, so let's go. Um, the chili, uh, I tend to do almost everything in layers, also make it easy to go back. And Yeah, absolutely. So, I talked about doing things in variants and, and, and cloning variants and so on. Obviously, with layers, you can also do this. So, on this final one, because I did the skin tone tool on a layer, I can turn that off. Because I did the top right color on a layer, I can turn that off and I can effectively go back. The problem that I find is if I've got a variant which I've now in, well, implemented, let's say, six different layers, I can't quickly enable or disable all of those layers at once, which sometimes I'd want to do to be able to compare. So what I'll sometimes do, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, if I forgot to do it as a variant, I can clone this variant. Um, oops, sorry, clone both the variants. So here's our final one. I'm going to clone that variant. And then on this variant, I'm going to turn off the layers that I want to compare. So now I can go to my edited one and the one with all the layers turned off. But I'm doing it via a variant because, in actual fact, because I can't group my layers. That would be quite nice, wouldn't it, to be able to group layers? <laughs> but we, we won't go into that because I can't do it at the moment. Um, Paula, adding a quick note would be helpful also. I agree. So at the moment, you can obviously add notes into, you know, we can put it into the description. We can put it into loads of different fields here. But it would be nice to just have you know, almost like a you know, PowerPoint presentation or whatever, just some notes um, held against the image. I, I agree. I think that would be a good move. Um, Shelly, is there a way to assign the other colors to the keyboard shortcuts like with the red and green? So you've got plus, minus, times, and divide. Um, I... I'm not sure whether you can. Let's just have a look at our keyboard shortcuts. Um, so one of the other colors is pink. So yes, we can. So under pink, I could set that to, I don't know, let's put it in as equal sign for now. Um, oops, let's go equals. So that's now set in my keyboard shortcuts. Um, if I come out of here and now press the equal sign, I've now got my pink. So. Yeah, live. Yeah, we can. Um, I just wasn't sure where the color tags were in there, but they are. So as default, you have as your color tags. And, and if ever you want to add your own keyboard or keyboard shortcuts, never forget you can you can do this. Edit menu, edit keyboard shortcuts. Not only can you edit them, you can save them as sets of keyboards uh, that you can apply between different um, different sessions. And if I type in color without the uh, U... <laughs> Um, so you've got a color tag in here, and if, for example, I wanted um, the blue to find out even what the blue tag is, but there we go. At the moment, it's not assigned. If I type in yellow, I will find it's the multiply sign. If I type in red, I'll find it's the minus sign, which are the standard ones. But now on my keyboard, if I type in pink, you'll see that the equal sign on my um, numeric keypad is now set to that color as well. So. Uh, yes, uh, in answer to your question, Chili, yes, you can um, set all the other shortcuts as well. Um, in field, I'm just about ready to switch from Lightroom to Capture One. Um, so, as a handy hint, I don't know if you are yet, but if you're going to, if you're going to the, or to the subscription model, um, then go for it. Um, do that. Well, start with a 30 day free trial. I mean, why not do that? Um, and then have a look at switching because. The 30-day trial is is non-restricted. It doesn't stop you doing any of that stuff. Um, so give that a go. Um, and then make your decisions to whether you want to buy the full license, um, at which point you may find that um, that you've got the new version on the horizon. Or if you go to the, or the subscription um, option, then it doesn't matter because you'll always be on the latest one anyway. Um... Where are we? Joe, dark and top right layer, did it change the color in the first place? You mean Alan's edit, I'm guessing. So there is a layer on here that Alan had, which is dark and top right. Um, if I go back to Alan's original edit and look at the uh, layer, it doesn't necessarily change the color. It has just changed the brightness um, of that area. And you can see it's just an exposure change. Um, so there's no custom change to the white balance sometimes it can have an effect of appearing like you've changed um, a color because the color gets richer or deeper or stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you've, you've just got to just be aware um, of that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the color itself has, has changed. Um, 
So, uh, well, there's lots of questions. So, Unfield again. So, only reason I haven't pushed the button yet is that I hear the management system is pretty difficult to manage. I disagree. Um, so, there are specialist tools out there. So, there are other um, systems that will plug into Capture One. So, you know, Photo Mechanic, for example. If you've got massive enterprise systems and so on, um, then absolutely you can get um, plug-in tools and, and helper tools that will help you manage your catalogs um, and collections and groups. In my own experience, so I this is only our obviously demo catalog, but my own catalog has tens and tens in some cases, well, if I add them all up together, but we're on hundreds of thousands of images. What I tend to find when people say that the management tools or the um, the catalog management stuff isn't very good in Capture One. When I then say to them, okay, can you show me your collections? Can you show me your folders? Can you show me your smart albums? Can you show me how you're organizing it? A lot of the time, the answer is, well, I don't. So, yes, if I put 50,000 images all into one folder and expect Capture One to automatically sort everything out, it's not going to do that. But then I'd be surprised if anything did. Um, you need to to work the collections and the albums and the smart albums and so on and filters as well to really get the best out of managing it but if you have a particularly large collection um and i know some some people do it may be worth looking at something like a photo mechanic plugin or, or similar there are others um that that help just organize some of that stuff um right let's have a little look through uh mario yeah how about using the skin tone tool to align the colors we did um you were just a little bit ahead of me there um so let's carry on and i don't think we've missed anything there no good okay so let's move on to brian's shot i think one thing i want to cover in fact we're going to start with this shot of brian's but I want to cover this week because it, it's come up a few times in the past week um, with some other people I've been talking with. Um, I'm never going to give you a set workflow of this is how to edit in Capture One. And I would genuinely say to you, if someone does, ignore them because they don't know what they're talking about. And the reason they don't know what they're talking about is because they don't know the exact workflow for the exact images that you edit and how your brain works. So I can have a workflow that I use, which is my order of tools, and I've got a checklist in my head that says, right, I need to do that first, that second, that third, for this style of photograph. And I might have a slightly different or adopted version of that for a different type of photograph. So if I'm shooting people, the tools that I use are going to be very different to if I'm shooting architecture or a cityscape or something like that. So be really wary of someone that says, this is the answer for your workflow. That said, there are some things that are worth doing before others, which isn't the same thing. So the first thing is lens corrections. And this is one where, unless there is a specific reason, this would be one of the first tabs I go to in every image, which is make sure it's got your profile. If it hasn't, so remember the order, ideally your exact lens. If not, then the manufacturer profile. If not, generic. Never guess a similar one because it's not the same lens. You're better off going with generic than you are trying to, to chase a one that sounds similar or looks similar. But load in your lens. If you have a, a, a need to fix chromatic or chromatic aberration, which some lenses have worse than others, always ideally do the analyze on your picture because it means that Capture One analyzes the chromatic aberration in this image, not just the generic stock one, not the manufacturer one, but in this shot, it actually analyzes it and makes sure that it fixes it for your setup on your camera with your lens. Diffraction correction. I know a lot of people have it in their head um, that they will, you know, if the second it's above f8, we tick diffraction correction. It can't be that binary. What you need to do is look at your edges, especially around the high contrast points. And we're at 202% here. If I put that tick on, does it sharpen it? Or does it not? And if it does, i.e., and you're typically going to find diffraction corrections useful above f8. So f8, f11, f16, f32, if you want to play up there, that's where you're going to get diffraction in lenses for sure. But if it doesn't help your picture, as with every tool in Capture One, don't tick the box because every single tick that we do can help but also risks damaging our output. 
So if you don't need the tool, in this case, on, off, I see no change. So we're not going to put it on. Now in here at 4.5, it's unlikely to anyway. But I've got images that I've shot at f11 where diffraction correction makes no difference on that particular lens. So don't tick the box. Distortion, again, Capture One is going to natively, if it's loaded in the correct lens, it's going to natively remember what distortion it should apply on average for that lens. But if you're shooting something more abstract or you're shooting you know, a wide landscape vista, as I correct for distortion, and on Brian's image it's going to be very slight because it's a, it's a zoom lens, but out here you know, we've, we're going to lose some of this tree as it corrects for distortion. And the reason is because that correction pulls at the edges. So if you want to maximize the amount of your image you've got in the shot, distortion correction is not going to do you very well. It does help straighten lines, it does help with city stuff and architecture, but again, use it if you need to, don't if, if not. Sharpness fall off. If you've got a lens which is very sharp in the middle and not very sharp on the outside, then use sharpness fall off. But if your lens is fine, if you don't have a softening effect at the edge of the, the image, you don't need to use this either. Because what this may do, if you're not careful, is risk over sharpening the edges. It's like a vignette for sharpening and leaving the middle um, untouched. Same with light fall off. If your lens vignettes, then turn on light fall off. It's going to lighten up the corners to fix that vignette. But if it doesn't, or you're zoomed in, on, if you've got a zoom lens and you're at the telephoto end of it, quite often that, that vignetting is gone. So you don't need to use that light fall off. Now, Capture One will always remember what it should apply for this particular lens because it's profiled. But just be really careful that you're only using the ones that you need to. So I would do lens correction before any other change. The second reason for it, not just for, for the purposes of making sure you've got the, the best start to uh, or start of the image, is because if I'm doing things like distortion correction or sharpness fall off, that may drive other decisions later. So it may change what I do with my crop. It may change my straightening. It may change my keystone. So all of those things are later on having done lens correction. If you try and, let's say you straighten the horizon, you, you fix your sharpening on the whole image, then you go back into lens corrections and add some sharpness fall off and, and add some distortion. You've got to go back and redo all of those things. So do these first and then move on to the other stuff. Keystone would be my next one um, at some point early on. And again, for the same reason, there's no point in making, for example, crop decisions so let's say I decide to go down to there on this shot. If I'm then later going to change the keystone, because I might push things out of the frame, in the frame. So just think about those things as almost the, the basics. Get your lens corrections and keystones in as early as possible before you start editing. Everything else is down to you. And that's why your workspaces are customizable in Capture One. So there's a reason we can move these tabs around. There's a reason I can add tools to any of these tabs. I don't have to have the tools in the positions that they come out of the box. I can move them around to match my workflow. And that's what I'd encourage you all to do. Don't just, don't just stick with whatever it, uh, whatever it came with out of the box. So on Brian's shot here, I'm just going to reset that crop. And we are going to turn um, some of the sharpness fall off on. And the reason being because there is a bit of softening that happens out here that isn't in the uh, in the middle of the frame. So I'm going to put up to 50. Noise, um, noise reduction, you might want to look at um, early on. Again, early on in the process. But remember, noise reduction you may have to come back to. Because if you start adding in structure and clarity... Um, and some of the other, or even sharpening for that matter, you may have to come back and do a bit of a seesaw with noise reduction to, to factor that in. But there is a little bit of noise in here, so I'm just going to up that from the default a touch. And again, you can see we're now seesawing, so noise reduction has an effect of softening some of my edges. So I might want to increase the sharpening. That's done pretty good. Um, but now, and let me show you, if I overdo my sharpening, I start getting halos around these edges, I have halo suppression in Capture One. I can get rid of those white areas around the contrast lines. But let's not over sharpen it in the first place. Let's head to sort of 
Mm, let's go maybe, maybe there, just a little bit up. Okay. So Brian's challenge was, I want to be able to uh, make this look like deep blue misty water um, and keep the, the mist and fog on the top. Well, there's, there's already layers in here, so we've got a background layer with some adjustments. With extra clarity loaded on, extra structure loaded on, fine. Haven't touched the dehaze tool. Um, and why? Because it's not really going to help us in here. We can add more haze to it, but that's just more of what we already have. Um, we've got a balancing layer, so the, the, this is a style brush, but the cool um, balance layer and the darken brush. Now these come from your style brushes up here, and in our color you'll have balance cool. So we've got a mask on here that Brian's just used to cool down the foreground. Uh, sorry, darken, that's the burn one, darken down the foreground, and the balance just to, to cool down this entire area of water here. Now, interestingly, just going back to the crop thing, this tool has stopped here, and there's a subtle line across the middle, and the reason is because this brush was done before the crop. So you've got to be careful with this. Imagine here this line, well, that's always going to be there, and now, because it's not 100% mask, if I switch my mask, so this um, button up here, I can go to display grayscale mask, you can see the mask isn't completely white and solid. It's actually sort of gray and varied along here which means I can't really go in and blend a mask in to fill the gap. If I try and fill the gap, let's uh, let's go to my brush on this one, and let's say I'm going to guess it's a, I don't know, 10 opacity, something like that, maybe even less. And I try and blend this in. Any time I go over that line, you can see it there, I've now got a doubling of that layer. And this comes from drawing a mask on an image that's cropped, and then removing the crop. So when you remove the crop, the area that you didn't draw on because it was cropped out is now left without that mask. So what I'm going to do on here is I'm actually going to um, clear the mask, leave the adjustment on, but I'm going to redraw a new soft mask over that area that does the same as what Brian was doing, um, but I'm just going to lower the amount that it does it as well on the... oops on the tool. So here we're going to go over there. So a bit more cooling in the middle and we'll blend that in up there. And now I'm going to go onto my layer because that's obviously overdone the blue because my mask was a lot stronger than Brian's. But I can go on here and change the opacity from zero effect to 100% effect and probably drop it maybe there. That sort of works. Okay, so I've still got my cool layer. Now, what about making this look a bit more um, myst or mystical or whatever? Well, what we could do, and it's interesting that on here, you've got on here, Brian, your mist layer, which is all of this stuff along here, reducing contrast. I would have actually gone one further than that, and it was interesting that on the background you added clarity. I get it. But on the foreground, I'm going to go one further, which is, let's call this foreground mist. And I'm actually going to, was I going to draw it or, no, let's just, we're just going to do a gradient up here. So we can see the bit that it's affecting here. And with this layer, I'm going to reduce the clarity down. So instead of adding clarity, which adds a lot of detail, I'm going to reduce it down. So it softens that layer. And the dehaze tool, remember what I said earlier? about that dehaze tool not helping because we want to show the mist. Well, I can use the negative dehaze tool, choose the color of the mist, and it's going to add mist in to this foreground. So I've now got a softer foreground through negative clarity. I can, if I want to, reduce brightness a little bit so it gets a bit deeper. I can up the saturation a touch. But that negative clarity and adding some haze, so using the dehaze tool in a negative way, adds mist. So if I turn that off and on, we've now got a much deeper, richer foreground mist. If we want to keep some of this structure along here, well, of course, what we can do is now erase some of that mask. So I'm going to make a very small brush, quite a low opacity, very soft. And I'm going to turn my mask on. When I go to erase, it's going to warm me. 
and say, do you want to rasterize this mask? What it means by that is I've created a gradient mask already, and that's what we call parametric. So I can edit that mathematically. I can stretch it. I can turn it. I can change the ratios of, of fall off. The second I start painting or erasing on a parametric mask, there's a, there's a mouthful. So anything that's either a gradient layer, or a linear gradient or a radial gradient, or for that matter, a luma range as well, if I rasterize it, that means it cannot be edited mathematically anymore, but it can be drawn on or erased from with the brush. And that allows me then to soften all of these areas around here, but keep that detail in the fog and the steam that's happening over there. Up here, um, this sky bit, I get the tendency to have this sort of line up here. I'm tempted to soften it a little bit. The way that I'm going to do that, new layer, and I'm going to call it uh, Soften Sky. I'm going to, again, use a gradient layer. But with this layer, I'm going to choose a luma range because I want to exclude the tree. So we want everything apart from that tree and a little soft radius around it and hit apply. So I've now got a, a range, a, a gradient that covers everything in the top apart from what I've excluded through the luma range. In other words, the dark parts of that of that scene. Similar with um, the skin tone tool again, actually. So we'll go to our skin tone tool and I'm going to choose a color that's somewhere in between these ones. So around there, I'm not going to change the color of this. I'm just going to tell it I want things to be a bit more uniform in hue, saturation and lightness. And you see this sky start to even up slightly. It's not, it's not a big change. If I want to reduce how bright this is, well, I can change the lightness of the out, well, output color. I could increase the saturation so it goes a bit more blue. I could shift it to be more pink, more green, but in this case, it was fine where it is. And you'll see without, we've got this very hard line. With, we've got that softening effect on the sky. If we don't like how much it's softened, again, because it's on a layer, I can reduce that opacity down so we can say, I only want half the effect. And you still get then this outline, but it just feels a bit more um, connected. I guess. Now back to, I think it was Chili's note earlier. Um, that was done on that image with all the layers. So I can see the differences that I've made by turning off the layers one by one. But if I want to see the differences with all of the changes that I made, well, I'd have to actually create either a clone variant and then build the changes. Or in this case, I've done a clone variant and just turned off both layers in the version that I'm seeing now. So there's our changes. There's before. You'll see it's a bit cleaner in terms of noise because we've done that softening of clarity down here. This is a bit more defined on this tree. It's got, um, so let's go to our final version, sorry. This is a bit more defined. We've got a much smoother gradient of color change up here. And we've got this nice deep rich base rather than um, the detailed one. Now, some people may prefer the detailed version, in which case, leave it where it is. Um, but if that's what you were trying to get to, Brian, which is effectively just creating a more soft, uh, misty look, but deeper um, and, and more lurky, I guess, um, then maybe do it that way, um, which is reducing clarity, negative dehaze, and maybe a skin tone tool on the top. Uh Right, let's just, uh, Brian's got another image in here, but I'm going to cover someone else's just quickly. Um, again, I just want to make sure we haven't missed any. Um, Claude, uh, do we use the lens collaboration tool and, and when? Uh, yes, but not in these, um, not on these images. Uh, what I will do is... Maybe next week uh, I will load up uh, one of my images from an XT camera, um, so tech cam um, camera, and we'll put on a, an LCC profile so you can see. Um, we'll, we'll try and do it that way. Um, effectively, that allows, so to, to Chili's question, um, lenses have what's called lens cast. Um, I don't think I've got it near me. Um, 
we can take a, a profile of a lens by putting a, a, an opaque white um, base on it, taking a standard picture, and then Capture One can work out what to do with um, that particular lens and the profile of that lens to your pictures. Um, so they, they turned out a little bit better, um, especially when it comes to color casting and stuff. So just... I'll I'll um we'll try and do it next week. Um, I'll I'll load up a, an XT picture with and without, and we'll put the cast um, profile in as well. Um, Daniel, is there a way to even out a mask when you go over an area more than intended? Um, not really, not really, unfortunately. Yeah, you you would likely have to do it over. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, funnily enough, it's why I quite like opacity rather than flow. The reason being, let me just show you if I clone this variant and create a new layer i'm going to switch to our grayscale mask so this is always about how people use it maybe people use it differently um small brush uh pretty soft and i'm going to set opacity high flow low which is one of the ways that you can use this now as i draw and i'm going to go left to right left to right left to right as i slow down we get and to go over the same spot, I get more and more strength in the flow of that brush. Go over it again, and the same thing. But if I want to undo, I can undo that last stroke, and I can undo all of the previous stroke, but I've lost everything then to a certain extent. If I flip that and go 100% flow but a low opacity, and this is the, one of the reasons why I do it this way, I'm just going to increase that, um, sorry, increase the hardness so you can see. As I go over one with one brush stroke, it doesn't matter how many times I go over this, I'm, I'm going over again and again and again, it's never going to increase beyond one, which is my setting for opacity. If I add now, let's say, an opacity of 10, go over it, it doesn't matter how many times I go over it, it's going to add a value of 10 in opacity. Go over it again. It doesn't matter how many times I go over it. The same spot is only going to get an extra 10 added. But think about what that does for undo. Because as I undo, I'm undoing one layer, another layer, another layer, another layer, one at a time with opacity. So I can undo effectively each layer that I'm painting. Whereas with flow, as I go over the same spot with the mouse held down, um, it's all now one big... Um, it's now one big blob i guess that, that when you undo you lose the whole lot unfortunately so uh let's that said let's go to barry's uh woodland shot so um this is barry's edited version i think this is possibly the original let's just have a look so before and after tool on the top don't forget that one we can slide left to right that shows me this is indeed the original this one here is the edit um, so what Barry's done, and going back to last week, we talked about overexposed versus underexposed. Funnily enough, um, oh, who was it? Uh, I think it was Francesco said uh, the the shot with the cave um, with the bright sky in it. Um, Francesco had actually taken another shot of exactly the same scene, but this time exposed for the sky and could pull up all of the shadow work. Um, yes, it came with a bit of noise, but... You protected the sky detail and then you can bring up the shadows much easier than trying to rectify a, a completely blown out highlight so in this case here looking at what barry's done i would say this is probably the right exposure because on this camera which is a nikon z something or z7 or z7 if you want to go down that road um with this camera it's able to pull up quite a lot of detail here in the shadows with not too much noise, there's a little bit of noise going on, but look at all this protection we've got of these highlights up here and all of this bright stuff. If this had been exposed a lot brighter, and, and there's probably some wiggle room in here, we could, probably could have moved it a little bit up, maybe by one stop to there. But much brighter than that, this would have been blown out, we cannot recover that. So, you know, going darker is possibly the better option to start with. Until you work out what your camera's capable of. I think on this one, Barry, you could have possibly um, pushed it by one stop, but where you are isn't a bad place. Um, but Barry's point was it doesn't feel right. Um, it, it feels more cold. Um, or it, I think the way that you put it was there was more of a warm glow um, when I was there. So 
Let's look at why that might feel that way. And one reason is these plants down here, this strong green color doesn't really tell me that there was warm light coming in. So I think through some of the recovery and some of this stuff is actually on, um, let me just turn off the grayscale mask. It's going to scare people. If ever, if ever you go and click on something and everything goes either red or completely white, it's probably because you have a mask enabled. So just either press M on your keyboard or, or go to that little button and get rid of it. So, yeah, we can um, just see what effect these styles are having. And this style brush here, um, or style overall, is having an effect here. And it's kind of making the colors shift a little bit, which I'm not... I'm honestly not too keen on. Um, this one here as an overall color is warming. That one sort of makes sense. The shadow lifting, um, well, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's lifting nine and eight values on the shadows. I'm not sure it's having too much of an effect. The brighten areas, obviously, in this foreground, that sort of makes sense. We've, we've brightened this pathway up to give it some subject. Um, the sunburst itself, so as a result of bringing up maybe some of the detail and applying those styles, we've lost some of the color. So this sunburst here has been boosted um, with the color adjustment. And then we've got some noise reduction and, and basic stuff. To me, this is, it, it doesn't feel quite, and the word in my head is congruent to the light that's there. So if this light is nice and warm, I would expect it to be echoed down here, in part in the foliage, but in part in this snow. Um, while this snow sits in the shadows, I get that, but for it to be so cold blue pink in, in tone just feels wrong for this color of light coming around because it would be bouncing around a certain amount. Uh, so I think some of this is that one there, um, this Emily Bay um, SB06. Um, so that's a, that's a style that's been added to the image. Um, it's been added with a mask, so it's only these areas here. I don't think we need to do it with that style, um, because that, by the look of it, is doing some color shifting of some sort here yet. Yeah. So it's adjusting colors. I think we need to do it in a slightly different way, which is using the color balance tool rather than the color editor. So it may be, number one, remember I've created a clone of the variant, so I'm not affecting the original edit um, from Barry, I'm affecting this one. So it may be that I undo the color editor on this layer. I'm going to leave the layer because it's masked quite nicely on the foliage. And with that layer, I'm going to go to my color balance tool and choose the mid-tones and just make them a bit warmer and the shadows may be a bit warmer too. Highlights maybe we can lift them in fact what we're actually doing when i start in the color editor and moving everything so if we're moving shadows warmer moving midtones warmer moving highlights warmer do you know what we should really do should go to white balance and move it warmer um that's going to save us an awful lot of uh, a lot of time um but maybe we shift that tint a little bit so we get a bit more sort of orangey colors in there and then i'm looking at where the mask is and where it isn't and we've got these other odd options around here so what I'm tempted to do with this one is create a new, I'm going to call it foreground greens layer. Take a new gradient, maybe up to there. And this is going to sound odd, but with my color editor, I'm going to choose the greens and I'm going to shift their hue to be towards the yellow, warmer in other words. And the yellow, I can shift a little bit and move that towards the reds. Now that does mean that I could almost remove this layer completely and instead do it on my foreground greens layer. So I can increase the saturation of our yellows a little bit while shifting them to being red and lighten them up. I can take the greens, shift them completely down to the yellow area. We could increase their saturation, but I don't think we need to. But what we can do is lighten them as well so we get a bit more um, color effectively out of it. And then with the overall image, well, what about if I just create a brand new filled adjustment layer and just warm us up a little bit? Um, now, if we want to have that feeling of looking into the sun, and if this is the brightest part of the image, we spend an awful lot of money making sure our lenses don't vignette, right? But if I want the feeling of looking towards the sun, it can sometimes help. Let's just go to our exposure tab 
to pull in some of those corners. And now we have something that feels more like that warm glow of warm light into a forest. It doesn't stop us pulling up shadows. So we can still see the shadows. We can still see the blacks. Um, so we pull up that slider there. We can get all of those darkest tones and lift them up. We can get into all the detail in here. But even actually, now I look at it, now we've pulled up those shadows. There's a lot of green on this tree here. Um, maybe not in the full version, but out of the preview it is. Um, so my temptation is on that overall layer, the overall adjustment layer that's that's filled. If I press M on my keyboard to see the mask, I get the whole lot. Um, with that fill, I could effectively just go into my color editor, again, up here, go to my greens, or I could select it. If I go to advanced, choose the selection tool, choose the green on the tree, make sure it's the green we're attacking, not the yellow. And with that, I could shift the hue a little bit. We can go more green, or we can go more towards the yellowy sort of area. We could up that saturation a bit, maybe darken it down a touch. Uh, maybe to there, that sort of works. Just to knock out some of the vibrancy on that green, um, just a little bit. In fact, let's just not do that saturation move and just rely on lightning instead. Okay, so to me, I'd go from there, which feels very cold, to there, if you're trying to get that feeling of warm light. If you want the diffusion to really, really kick in, there's another little method we can use. So I'm going to, again, right-click, clone this variant. So I've got a new variant. I'm just going to move that up so we can see it. And I'm going to create a new layer, and I'm going to call it Diffusion. With this layer, I'm going to put a radial mask on. So a really soft mask. It has no effect in the middle, 50% of this ring, 100% on the outside. With that mask, similar to last time on the last image, we're going to reduce some clarity. Not a lot, because we don't want to lose everything, make it all blurry. But a little bit less clarity and a touch of haze adding in. And I'm going to choose the haze color out there. And then also, because as I add in haze, it might actually lighten the image a little bit, because it's, it's haze that adds the, the brightness, I can go into my exposure overall and just pull that down. And I think you get to a, a much warmer place. So if, if the goal was to make this feel warm, so if that was my original, and I can see that it's nice warm light, it may be that correcting and, and recovering all the detail in this case has done a great job. You know, the camera's done a great job of capturing all that detail, but the corrections and some of these styles have an effect of cooling down, which is what you were saying, Barry, doesn't feel quite right. By reducing that and going to here, I think we're in a much nicer place um, if that was the effect you were going for. Um, our overall um, overall adjustments. Our overall layer, if I want to increase saturation a touch, you know, just be really careful that you don't overdo that. Um, and then maybe a little shift of tint. Again, small changes, but enough just to get you back to that warm place. I'm going to create a clone of this quickly and answer Jed's point. So what about using linear response? So on our curve here, we, we touch on this quite often now, you've got film standard. Film standard is the same as auto. Uh, it's the same curve. We could shift to linear response. Linear response is, and what we'll do is we'll actually do it from the original. Uh, let's just clone that one. If I go from an auto curve to a linear response curve, it's going to effectively flatten out the contrast levels in the in the image. Now, in this case here, we don't really have a really bright area and a, and a really dark area. We've just got a very, very dark image. So even though the auto version, and let's just move that there. So here is our auto or film standard. Here is our linear response. Linear response will allow us to pull up some exposure and some shadow and some black a little bit more softly, a little bit more calmly. Um, if I applied the same changes to our original here, but left us with the auto curve. So this is the exact same changes. Linear response, auto. You see you get more contrast in the auto or film standard, same thing. Less contrast in linear response, but possibly more control over texture. The problem is if we want the image to feel like that, which is a bright sun coming in and, and warming up the scene, 
you've got to be careful with linear response because it's going to effectively dull down um, dull down that scene or dull down the contrast in the scene and we do want to keep that contrast there for the sun so that's where I would go with it um, there's nothing wrong with this shot it's a good recovery of all of the decent um, information the camera got but if the idea was to try and get the scene warmer and feel more um, I guess foresty um, and, and sort of golden glow then that's what I'd do and it, it does mean knocking out one of these styles and using white balance a bit more than the color editor um, to do that Right, um, so that's it for today. I think that's an hour of everyone's time. Well done, you made it. Uh, we will start next week with Joe's cityscape shot. This one, um, there's a question about whether to leave the light in or not, but we'll we'll do some adjustments on that. And we'll probably go back to Brian's cloud one and then we'll look at the other stuff that is in. But for today, we've got Barry's Woodland. Um, really nice shot. And actually, that camera has done a good job of pulling up a lot of the shadow work in there, which is great. So do expose to try and protect the highlights feel free to go over a little bit but you know you can always recover a shadow you can't recover something that's blown um brian's shot across the water um, just smoothing it out getting less detail ironically in the foreground but making it deeper and more blue and then alan's color correction top right and a load of stuff we've just covered about workspace and keywords and lens corrections and all that stuff so go enjoy that stuff for the next week we will catch you um, next week, next Thursday, so normal time. Um, in the meantime, obviously, you're all welcome to join in on Facebook. There's the discussion stuff going on and probably about these pictures. Uh, don't forget to send in your files. So poryforlive.wetransfer.com. Upload your images with uh, any adjustments you've made, if you have any, but also what's wrong or uh, what you're struggling with and your name. No name, no picture. Done. Um, so upload as many as you can. Um, we'll try and get through as many as we can next week. But between now and then, look after yourselves and we'll catch you in a week's time. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.